So I invite you to turn with me to Psalm uh, 69, or sorry, 68, 68, and we'll be reading verses 7 through 23, and then we will turn again to Ephesians 4. So Psalm 68, Psalm 68, starting at verse 7. O God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain, before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel, rain in abundance, O God, you shed abroad. You restored your inheritance as it languished. Your flock found a dwelling in it. In your goodness, O God, you provided for the needy. The Lord gives the word. The women who announce the news are a great host. The kings of the armies, they flee, they flee. The women at home divide the spoil. Though you you men lie among the sheepfolds, the wings of a dove covered with silver, its pinions with simmering gold, When the Almighty scatters kings there, let snow fall on Zalman. O mountain of God, mountain of Bashan, O many-peaked mountain, mountain of Bashan, why do you look with hatred, O many-peaked mountain, at the mount that God desired for his abode? Yes, where the Lord will dwell forever. The chariots of God are twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. Blessed be the Lord, who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation, and to God the Lord belong deliverances from death. But God will strike the heads of his enemies. The hairy crown of him who walks in his guilty ways. The Lord said, I will bring them back from Bashan. I will bring them back from the depths of the sea. That you may strike your feet in their blood. That the tongues of your dogs may have their portion from the foe. And now we turn to the book of Ephesians. To the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll be reading verses 1 through 16. Uh, But the focus of the sermon will be verses 7 through 11. Let's start at verse 1, Ephesians 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope, that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up, in love. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. As we, as Christians, think about the glory of God and we think about 
the building of the kingdom. One of the great questions that confronts us is this. How does the church mature and grow? The truth is, whenever we want to build something or we want to construct something, we have plans. We have, we have instructions. We have blueprints. And the truth is, there are many ideas and strategies with regard to how to grow the church. There are books written and conferences held about church growth and church revitalization. There's a recognition that this is an important question. How does the church mature and grow? Well, as we ask that question, one of the things we always need to remember is the words of Christ. When he said to Peter, I will build my church. It's not wrong for us to come up with practical questions. It's not wrong for us to seek principles in scripture about how to grow the church of Christ. But as we do so, we must ever keep before our minds the fact that we have one king and one head. And at the end of the day, it is he who is building his church. This afternoon, we come again to Ephesians 4, a passage in which Paul actually addresses this very question of how the church grows and is built up. Now, last week we saw in verses 1 to 6, we saw Paul's declaration that at its spiritual core, the church of Jesus Christ is one because God has made her one. However, as Paul moves on to verse 7, he goes on to show us that the fact that we are one does not mean that we are all the same. In a way that reflects our triune God, there is diversity in our unity and there is unity in our diversity. And what Paul wants to highlight for us is that this diversity in the body of Christ is an essential part of how the body of Christ is grown and built up. We're all different. We all have different personalities, different backgrounds. We all have different gifts given by God. And God has given us these different gifts specifically in order that we might serve one another in love and so as a whole body, we might grow up together unto spiritual maturity. And so what Paul is essentially doing from verse 7 to verse 16 of this chapter is he is answering that very question that we asked. How does the church mature and grow? However, before Paul gets into the actual process by which the church is built up, he first sets our minds and our hearts upon the source and the fountain of all spiritual gifts, all spiritual grace in the church, by fixing our eyes upon the ascended Christ. Then he goes on from there to highlight some specific gifts that hold a central part in the, the building up of the body. And this is what we're going to look at this afternoon, verses 7 to 11. And first we're going to look at Christ, the giver of gifts. And then we'll look at some of the important gifts that Christ has given. So first in verses 7 to 10, let us look at Christ, the giver of gifts. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the books, The Chronicles of Narnia. Well, there's a scene in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe in which Peter and Susan and Lucy are uh, with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, and they're running away from the agents of the White Witch, and they spend an evening in a cave. And the next morning, they hear the sound of jingling bells. And they go outside the cave and they find Father Christmas is there. And Father Christmas takes out his, his bag and he pulls out all these gifts and he begins to distribute them to each one, each member of the party. And what he does is he distributes specific gifts to each one of the children. Peter receives a sword. Uh, Susan receives a bow. Lucy receives a little vial of medicine. And as you read on in the story, you find that the, the gifts that Father Christmas gives each person were specifically suited to who they were. And as you read on in the story, you find that each one of them is going to need that gift later on. You could change the illustration and think of the Lord of the Rings. In Lothlorien, Galadriel gives to each member of the Fellowship of the Ring a gift. And I think there's a scene in which uh, Galadriel gives to Merry and Pippin a sword. And then she comes to Sam and she gives him a rope. And Sam looks at the rope kind of with disappointment. And he says, I don't suppose you have another one of those nice shiny daggers, do you? And Lady Galadriel just smiles and moves on. 
Now, it's those, that, that kind of picture that we have in verse 7. Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Here we have a picture of Christ distributing gifts among his people. And Paul wants to emphasize for us two things. First, he wants to emphasize that each one of us has been given a gift. Grace was given, he says, to each one of us. That is to say, there is not a single member of the body of Christ who has been left without something by which they might bless the whole body. And the king and the head of the church, Jesus Christ, has distributed his gifts to each person by his grace. This isn't something that we work up in ourselves. This isn't something that we earn. This is part of the fullness of grace that comes to us in the gospel through Christ. Now, in the New Testament, there are various lists of gifts, but there are no, there's no indication that these, these lists that we have in the New Testament are exhaustive. But whatever the case may be, what we are told very clearly is that every single one of us who is a born-again Christian, who is a member of the body of Christ, has been given a gift. Of the second thing that Paul wants to emphasize is that every one of our gifts has been sovereignly given. Grace was given to us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So not only do we all have a gift, but we have been given the specific and exact gifts that King Jesus wants us to have. As the king and the head of this church, he has distributed his gifts according to his perfect will. Like Father Christmas, like Galadriel, he's given to each one of us exactly what he knows that we will need as we move forward in the good works that he has planned in advance for us to walk in. So right away then, as we face verse 7, we need to recognize how important it is for us to understand and for us to submit to Christ's sovereignty in this area. You have the gifts that you have because of the good pleasure and the kindness and the wisdom of Jesus. And it really emphasizes for us what a foolish and what a wicked thing is envy. When we look around the body of Christ and like Sam, we say, I don't suppose you have more of that person's gifts, do you? I don't like my gift. When we set our minds on other people's gifts, we are in essence calling into question the wisdom and the kindness of our King. Now, rather than looking at other people's gifts, we are called to think soberly about ourselves and to use that which we have been given as good stewards of the body of Christ, setting our minds not on our own gain, but setting our minds upon the building up of the body. Well, as Paul goes on from that initial statement, he goes on to confirm and to highlight the awesome reality that lies behind this, this picture of Christ distributing gifts. And he does this by quoting from Psalm 68. Look at verse 8 with me. It says, Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now, Psalm 68, we read a portion of it. Psalm 68 is a psalm of triumph. It's a psalm that declares the victory of the Lord over all of his enemies and over all the enemies of his people. It begins this way. God shall arise and his enemies shall be scattered and those who hate him shall flee before him. But the righteous shall be glad, and they shall exult before God, and they shall be jubilant with joy. And the first half of Psalm 68 is really a historic uh, review of the victory of God over the enemies of Israel as they traveled through the wilderness to the promised land. And there's a picture of God moving from Sinai, Mount Sinai, and heading towards Mount Zion, which is in the Old Testament a picture for Jerusalem. The sanctuary, the place of God's dwelling where the temple was. And the second half of the psalm is filled with confident declarations that God's victories are going to continue. There's a picture of God sitting enthroned upon his, uh, in the temple, sorry, sitting on the throne in the temple at Jerusalem and all the nations bowing to him and bringing gifts before him. And Paul's quotation comes right from the middle of that psalm in a part that is speaking of God's ascent to the sanctuary of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, when quoting this psalm, what Paul is saying 
is he is saying that the ultimate fulfillment of what is being pictured in Psalm 68 is the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul proves this for us. The, the, the apostles don't always do this when they quote from the Old Testament. They apply it to Christ. They don't always show us the reasoning behind how they applied this to Christ. But Paul does here. In verses 9 and 10, he basically sets forth his logical process by which he deduced. This is very much speaking about Christ. And basically his logical process goes like this. If God is ascending, that means there must first have been a descent. Because God is the one who is the highest of all. He sits in the highest place of glory. How can God be said to ascend unless he first chose to come down? And though, of course, the Old Testament does talk in various uh, times of God ascending and descending, Paul is saying that the great and final uh, descent of God, the one to which all the others pointed to, we know has been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. When God took on the form of sinful flesh, he became a man and he came down to the lower regions, the earth, that he might live and walk among us. Christ descended and he, on this earth, fought a great battle and he overcame his enemies. And then he ascended on high in triumph and in victory. And really what this shows us is that all the Old Testament accounts of God's victory over his enemies were really just little pictures, little foretastes pointing ahead to the great victory that Christ won at Calvary. And so Psalm 68 then, with its declaration of God coming in victory to dwell in the temple at Jerusalem, has its final and fullest reference to Christ ascending in victory to God's heavenly sanctuary, to the new Jerusalem, to the place of highest dominion. But that is only half the picture. Because there is a twofold focus in Psalm 68, and there's a twofold focus really in this quotation, verse 8. There is, on the one hand, there is the picture of triumph. The triumph of God over his enemies, leading hosts of captives. But then there is a second focus, and that is the focus of God, after having obtained the victory, pouring out grace, pouring out gifts, pouring out blessing upon his people. And the picture is the picture of a conqueror in the ancient world. When conquerors would go out and they would overcome the enemy, they would come back to their city after having destroyed their foe, and they would come in triumphal procession into their city. And all of the prisoners of war, the captives that they had obtained, would be following in, in humiliated chains behind them, putting on, being put on display for the cheering crowds. And the, these, these were, were times of great uh, displays of great magnificence, great glory. It was times when the kings were glorying in, in what they had done. But following the triumphal procession, the spoils of war, all the booty that they had obtained from their enemies... A generous king would then distribute those spoils among his loyal subjects. And it's that kind of picture that Paul is pointing to. It's that kind of picture that Psalm 68 is pointing to. But there's a problem here. The problem is that Paul actually misquotes Psalm 68. If you turn to Psalm 68, we did read this. And verse 18, you'll read this. You ascended on high leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men. But when Paul quotes it, he says this, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. There's a difference between receiving gifts and giving gifts. Now there are various debates about why exactly Paul is doing them. Some of them are ridiculous. The liberals use this to call into question the inspiration of scripture, of course. But the simple answer to this is found in remembering that the Apostle Paul was inspired by the same spirit who inspired the psalmist. And so as Paul quotes from Psalm 68, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he changes the word in order to set clearly before us its fulfillment in Christ. In essence, what Paul is doing is he's doing the same thing that he did in verse 9 and 10. He's following a logical process. There he said, if, Christ, or if God ascended, he must have first descended. 
And so here he's saying if Christ received gifts, then certainly he received them in order that he might give them to his people, that he might pour them out upon his people. And if you read Psalm 68, it's, it's an idea that is by no means foreign to the psalm. Because there is this twofold focus, again, the triumph of the enemies and the enrichment of God's people. And so, brothers and sisters, we have then that glorious picture. At the cross, Christ triumphed over his enemies. Colossians 2 writes, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities. And he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. At the cross, Christ defeated all his enemies and all our enemies. The hosts of wickedness, the hosts of darkness were dealt a death blow. Their power was taken away. Their authority was broken. But having won the victory, God then highly exalted Christ and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. And there's a glorious picture as a, you, you think of that picture of the, the triumphal entry, the triumphal procession of the returning conqueror. There's a glorious picture of that in Psalm 24. You have the gates of heaven, and they're given the command. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And the gates of heaven respond with the question, well, who is this King of glory? Who is it that would dare to ascend the hill of the Lord? And the resounding answer is, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And that's the picture of Christ in his ascension. It was a time of glory as Christ ascended into the heavenly throne room. Something we don't see, something we see by faith. Something that all the angels, all the spiritual beings in heaven gloried in. You can read about that in Revelation 5. Christ ascending in glory and triumph to the right hand of his Father. But it doesn't end there. And praise be to God, it doesn't end there. Because after the ascension came Pentecost. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, Paul says, in order that he might fill all things. That he might fill this world with his presence, with his glory, and with his power. And central to that is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The spirit who is poured out upon the church to give new life. And Peter actually draws this out in his Pentecost sermon. He speaks about Christ's death and resurrection. And then he says this. He says, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. And so he ascended up to God and he received the Holy Spirit. But then he turned and he poured out that spirit upon his people. And it's the spirit, of course, who gives each one of us our individual gifts. As he talks about giving gifts to men. It is the Holy Spirit who works in each member of the body, the spiritual gift that we have. And what it emphasizes for us, brothers and sisters, is that Jesus Christ is not a selfish king. He does not hoard the spoils of his victory for his own advancement, for his own glory so much. But he, everything that he has obtained, all the spoils of his war, in generosity, he pours them out. He pours them out upon his people. That's the picture of who our Savior is as he sits at the right hand of God. Well, as we approach then this subject of the growth, the question how does the church grow and mature? This is something that we must never lose sight of. We must keep the ascended Christ and his spiritual kingdom ever in our view. He is the one who is the source of all grace. And he is the giver of every gift. And brothers and sisters, we have nothing outside of Jesus. And if he is not filling our sight and dominating our focus, then what is going to happen is that we're going to be thrown back on our own resources, our own strength, our own wisdom as we approach that question, how do we grow the church? We're going to lose sight of Christ's spiritual kingdom and we'll make it a kingdom of this earth, a political force or a social force. And whatever the church ends up becoming in society, if Christ is not at the center, that church will not be what God intends it to be. 
It will not display the manifold wisdom of God to the principalities and powers because it will be just a work of men. It will just be a religious tower of Babel. No, our eyes must be on the ascended Christ, the king and the head of his church. He tells us what to do. and He gives us the grace to do it. Everything revolves around him. Now, I've spent a fair bit of time here because it's so important that we have that picture of authority and confidence before us as we talk about growing together as the church. However, the truth is the focus of Paul in Ephesians 4 is not so much on that reality as it is on the gifts that Jesus has given. And so let us then look secondly at some of the gifts that have been given by Christ in verse 11. We read there, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so Paul moves on from talking about Christ giving gifts to his church to focus on the ministers of the word, whom he declares to be gifts given to the church. And though, of course, he has earlier said that everyone has been given a gift, he he draws attention specifically to those who have gifts that are connected with holding office in the church of Jesus Christ. Now, this may not seem like a very relevant subject to talk about, about and to spend time in, but the truth is there's great confusion in the church today with regard to these offices. And the result of it has been serious error and abuse. If you look at the new apostolic reformation, uh, there were men are claiming to be modern day apostles and to claiming to be infallible. And probably all of us have met people who are, who claim to be modern day prophets and ultimately these end up leading many astray. And so there's importance here for us to spend some time looking at what these offices are. Now we can divide the offices that Paul speaks about here into two categories. There are temporary offices and there are permanent offices. And the apostles and prophets first were the temporary offices of the church. They were God's gift to the church specifically to lay the foundation of the church. If you look back at chapter 2, verse 20, and at uh, chapter 3, verse 5, we we are told there that the apostles and prophets, and this is speaking of New Testament prophets, they were given the unique gift of receiving uh, inspired, infallible insight into the mystery of the gospel. They were given insight into what the coming of Christ really meant. And as such, they they instructed, they built up the church in order to lay the foundation in the gospel. And so, of course, the apostles also had the added authority of being uh, really holding universal authority in the church. They were the witnesses of Christ, specifically appointed by him. But the prophets also had infallible, uh, inspired revelation into the mystery of the New Testament, of the New Covenant. And we need to recognize that these were a beautiful gift to the church. Just think of that. When the church was in its infant and its immature stage, Christ gave these offices to his church in order that they might lay a solid foundation in the gospel. And of course, the great culmination of that is what we have in the New Testament. This is the enduring apostolic witness. It's the prophetic word about Christ and his salvation. But here's what we need to realize. That as the foundation of the church, these offices were temporary. And they fulfilled their purpose in laying the foundation. And so they are no longer functioning today in the church. And you might say, well, why are we talking about this then? I mean, if they're no longer functioning today, what does that have to do with me? What has everything to do with you? Because what it does is it emphasizes for us the gift of having the apostolic witness. You see, a right understanding of the apostles and prophets as a temporary office emphasizes for us the sufficiency of the scriptures for the growth of the church. We don't need prophets to tell us any more revelation. We have it all in the scriptures. So those who are running around the church claiming to be modern day apostles and prophets, they may not say it, But in essence, what they are saying in making that claim 
is they are saying that the witness left to us in the Bible is not enough. They are saying that we need more revelation. And it's for that reason that we need to be careful about this kind of thinking. We need to appreciate the uniqueness of Christ's gift of apostles and prophets. Well, Paul goes on and he talks then about the evangelists. Now, there's a lot of debate about what exactly this, the office of evangelist was in the New Testament. Uh, but the simple answer to that is that the evangelists served as apostolic representatives. When Paul was in prison, he would send someone like Titus or Timothy, an evangelist, and they would go in his name as his ambassador, bearing his authority to fulfill certain tasks in the churches that Paul left behind. And so Paul says to Titus, I give you the authority to ordain elders in every church. By himself, he could ordain elders. And so he was carrying, as a representative of the apostle, apostolic authority for a specific task. And so, of course, recognizing that shows us that with the passing away of the apostolic office, in this sense, the office of evangelist was also temporary. However, that being said, in the ARP, we still talk about the office of evangelist. I'm ordained as an evangelist. And there was some shift in the focus. With the passing away of the apostles, we now view evangelists not as apostolic representatives, but rather as representatives of the presbytery. And so they come in that same way. They come with the authority of the presbytery, and they're given unique authority to do certain tasks, to lay the foundation of a church in some kind of mission field situation. And so evangelists can appoint elders by themselves. And so that's recognizing that we see a certain focus to evangelists. But then finally, Paul mentions the shepherds and teachers. I'm not going to get into all the technical details here, but the Greek grammar points us to the fact that Paul meant to connect these two offices together into one. In essence, he was saying shepherd teachers. One of God's promises in the Old Testament concerning the coming of the new covenant was he said, I will give them shepherds after my own heart to feed them with knowledge and understanding. Shepherd and teacher go together. And so referring to shepherd, he's speaking of a pastor, of an elder, one who, who shepherds the flock of God spiritually. And then, of course, a teacher is one who preaches and teaches. And so in essence, what Paul is talking about here is the enduring office of the pastor. It's a permanent office that, has, uh, that continues today, and it holds the central place in the teaching and equipping of the church. Now, having understood that, I want to step back from that, and I want to just ask you, what is it that connects all of these offices together that Paul has talked about? The connecting factor is that all of these are gifts that focus upon the ministry of the word of God. And so keep that in mind, because of course, we're all asking the question as Paul says this, well, why does Paul exclusively focus on these gifts? I mean, he said in verse seven that every one of us has been given a gift. Why is he now only focusing on specific gifts? Well, the simple answer to that question is that Paul is drawing attention to these gifts because of the specific function that they have in equipping the rest of the body. Ministers of the word have a unique function in the growth of the body as those who teach and train others. And so they are those who have been gifted in a special way by the ascended Christ in order to set Christ before all the people. That all of us might find our source of life, source of, of blessing and grace in him. So at the end of the day, Paul is not saying that these gifts are superior to any other. Because, of course, if everyone was an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? Uh, Paul is not saying they're better. They're more important. But what he is saying is that with regard to the growth of the body, these gifts hold a central place. Well, brothers and sisters, whatever else that does, it needs to impress upon us from the very outset. As we talk about the growth of the church, it emphasizes for us how dependent we are upon the word of God. Christ's way of building his church is to instruct it in the truths of the gospel. And so ministers of the word are a precious gift because 
Through them we are instructed, we are built up, and we are shepherded into the green pastures of the Word of God. As we think about this then, we need to marvel at the goodness and the wisdom of the King and Head of the Church. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ has provided in every way for the full salvation of his people. He not only won the victory against sin and Satan on the cross, but he poured out the spoils of his conquest upon us. He gave us the Holy Spirit. But more than that, he then gave the gift of ministers to equip us. The means by which we can come to know Christ and be equipped in our service of the body. Christ has provided the grace and he's provided the means by which we might receive that grace. Christ has provided in every way for the salvation of his people. And woe to us, and I mean that, woe to us if we are found neglecting this salvation. If we just say, ah, whatever, I'll just sit and and, and go through the motions, but I'm not laying hold of the grace of God in Christ. King Jesus has provided everything. But it also says, shame on us if we have received that grace and salvation, but then we rest content to just sit back in spiritual immaturity. If we neglect the means of grace, the gifts that Christ has given, and we don't press on, press on in the calling that Christ has set before us. Shame on us if we are found grumbling and complaining and envying and taking Christ's gift and making them sources of controversy and strife rather than stirring up the gift of God that is in us that we might wash the feet of the saints and build up the whole body until we attain to the fullness of the maturity of Christ. Brothers and sisters, Do not look around at other members in the body looking at their gifts and saying, I want that gift, I want that gift, whatever. Take your eyes off of that and set your eyes upon the ascended Christ and think about the gifts that he has given you by his grace, his goodness, and his power. He's given you gifts uniquely suited to you in order that you might bless the body. No more selfishness in the church of Christ, but fixing our eyes upon our king in our head and laboring to build one another up in love. At the very outset, as we ask the question, how does the church mature and grow? That's that's 101. We start with our eyes upon Christ and we move on from there. And we'll look at that more next week. And so may God give us grace. To never lose sight of our king who ascended on high, leading a host of captives in order that he might give gifts to men. Let us pray. Our glorious Savior, King Jesus, our King and our Head, we worship and we adore you for all that you have done for our salvation. We worship and we adore you, that as you sit at your Father's right hand in that place of highest glory, you are not there as one who is self-consumed, but you are looking at your people, thinking about our blessing and our good. And gracious Savior, we pray that you would help us as the body of Christ who has received so much from you to to, 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 to imitate you to not be selfish about our gifts, but in imitation of our Savior, to take the gifts that we have received and use them for the good of one another. Gracious Father, we thank you for the instruction of your word. We pray that you build us up in it. We pray that we would grow more and more until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And we pray this in your name. Amen.